Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to Movie House Concessions, the podcast where we review the best films, the worst, and everything in between. I'm Chris. I'm Jonna. Hey, everybody. This is Chad. And for today's episode, we have a new person on Movie House Concessions, our own male bonder himself, Matt Palmer. Thanks for coming on, Matt. You're welcome, Chris. And since this is my first time, I wore my formal hula hoop. Oh, it's got all the oh, colors man. of the rainbow in it, doesn't it? All of them. Yeah. I never knew your hips could move like that, but uh, you prove me wrong every time. Oh, it all moves like that, Chris. <laughs> And for this wonderful episode, we are reviewing one of 2016's best films, Eye in the Sky, directed by, who in the hell is this directed by? Directed by Gavin Hood and star starring Helen Mirren, uh, Aaron Paul, Alan Rickman, and so a few other people. But, uh, Jonna, this was your pick. Do you have a summary for us? I do. In this 2016 military thriller directed by Gavin Hood, Colonel Catherine Powell, played by Her Helen Mirren, sees her mission to capture terrorists in Kenya escalate when intelligence reveals a plot to bomb civilian targets. The film alternates perspectives between her view and the story unfolding internationally as assets work to thwart the plot and eliminate the targets. Tenses are high as a decision is made to drop a Hellfire missile on the terrorists, and Colonel Powell has to evaluate the risk to civilians in the area. Joined by the late Alan Rickman is Lieutenant General Frank Benson, Bakad Abdi as Jama Farah, and an undercover agent on the ground in Kenya, Colonel Powell leads a tense exploration of the ins and outs of drone warfare, taking the viewer behind the scenes of the interplay of international relations, military service, and the cost of war. Ta-da! No spoilers. No spoilers. And no breaths. You read that one pretty quick. I always do. That's why you have me read the legal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, Matt, um, this is your first time on concessions, so we'll start with you. Uh, I know this is one of your favorites of 2016. Uh, what drew you to this film? Uh, well, I think the subject matter itself was interesting. I think that's what got me into the theater. Um, and the, the, the cast, I mean, it's very well cast. And, um, you know, when you put together a good ensemble cast, it seems like there's you, you start dragging a wide net as far as getting people in. And, you know, I wanted to see Aaron Paul. I wanted to see Helen Mirren. And I wanted to see a movie about drones. Chad, what did you think about this one? I enjoy the subject matter. It's a good film. Uh, I enjoy watching anything like this where you can, like Matt said, you get a large group of talented actors and actresses together. And especially when you find out that none of them technically worked together, they all worked separately and they try to piece it all together into one big film. Um, it's a very good subject matter. It makes you stop and think about what's going on. And not since uh, Boo Boo the Owl and Clash of the Titans as a mechanical bird brought me so much joy. I, I didn't re it, until you said that. It never occurred to me that these people were never in the same room together. Yeah, I mean, they probably never actually heard each other's voice when they were recording their lines. Yeah, that's correct. The director worked with everybody individually to get th uh, all their stuff done and then brought it back together when they edited the film together. So, yeah, this is one of those fascinating films from that perspective. And, Jonna, this was your pick, so what drew you to it? Because I don't really consider this your style film, but maybe I just don't know your type of films. They can't all be Jim and the Holograms, Chris. Okay. That's true. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. No, I um, actually... For the most part, military movies are ruined for me. Um, I know a little bit too much about the tactics involved and things like that, and so it makes it hard for me to have suspension of disbelief. Um, but the, really, the cast on this one was what drew me to the film. Alan Rickman, of course, Helen Mirren, um, and then Shane A., actually, the absentee Shane A., um, told me to, that I should see it. So I went to see it and was... Really, really impressed. Yeah, this isn't my style movie at all. I'm not a big war movie person, but I saw this because you recommended it, and I was impressed as well. I, I like the the characters in this film, but um, one of the things that kind of um, kind of threw me off was how how realistic to tactics would this be? 
because uh, I kind of, at times, I was just like, everybody stop being pussies and just somebody make a decision, either do it or don't. And uh, maybe that's what the drama was about, I guess. But um... Yeah, the problem that I had with it as far as sort of suspension of disbelief and the realism of the movie was not necessarily the interplay between the characters and the way that the decision is made, because I think it's sort of purposefully slow motion. Um, but it was the, a little bit about the technology. I mean, we don't really have bug size camera video feeds that we can put in someone's house. Like, in that way, in the way that they're done. But that didn't even really pull me out of the story because for me, the story was about the psychology of when we decide to drop a bomb on somebody and all of the people involved in that decision, right? Like from from Helen Mirren down to the drone operator in Las Vegas, you know, and that's true to life, that that's where they really are. And that's, they do make those decisions out of a trailer on a ba in a base in Vegas. So for me, I didn't, none of that sort of, sucked me in or pushed me out of it it's it was the fact that this isn't a decision that just is made willy-nilly that this is real people making this decision and weighing the consequences yeah i'll say this uh i don't think this movie should have been called eye in the sky i think it should have been called pass the buck because that's what everybody was basically trying to do in this film for uh, a large portion of it was Nobody wanted to take responsibility for something, even though there's protocols in place, which that was the one part of this film I sort of had issues with is we know there's so many military protocols in place that I really doubt that there would have been this many. You need to go talk to this person to go talk to this person to go talk to this person to go talk to oh, this person. Oh, yeah, there would have been. Uh, okay, if there would, uh, well, I'm wrong, but yeah, I just, I just felt like they sh should have probably had it would have probably stopped at the scene where the uh, drone pilot told the colonel, no, I'm not going to do something because I have the controller in my hand. That's where my disbelief of everything came extra strong. I'm like, I called bullshit on that one. So that's why I, everything past that when everybody's trying to call everybody who's on the shitter, not on the shitter, uh, scared to talk to drop their ping pong paddle. That, all of that sort of just lost me after that because it was just a big game of pass the buck and trying to make it more psychological than it needed to be. But for the most part, it was well done in how they did it. I just thought they tried to play pass the buck a bit too much. Well, I think like, okay, so my background on this is that I was married to a Marsoc Marine for like a decade and the number of stories about this exact kind of thing where nobody would make a decision and, and where your sort of career can hang in the balance of going one way or the other. And then someone above you being upset about that, that part of it actually seemed realistic to me that, that when there, because there's the part where Helen Mirren says, um, I think it's Helen Mirren that says, if we, if we're wrong or if we draw, if we kill civilians, they win the propaganda war. And if we don't kill them, they win the battle. And that balance between that decision, like the the psychological operations of it and the making, the making of the decision has multifaceted consequences. It isn't just about stopping the attack. It's about giving them like sort of propaganda or, or recruitment tools or those sorts of things to if you say the americans killed children then you that's a that becomes a recruitment tool and i think that the the commands and the different areas of the military and the state department and the internationally especially because you got to remember this is kenya this is a friendly nation that we're not occupying so just dropping a bomb on them like if this had been state if this had been in iraq or syria or somewhere where we're already bombing then I would agree with you that this is that it was weird that they didn't do it. But this is a friendly country that we're not at war with. So I think that complicates it a little bit. Yeah, I, I saw it less as a war movie and much more of a, um, a, legal, a legal and political drama. Yeah, I, think I did it was too. Much more about, um, you know, how might these decisions be made than it was about 
Um, I mean, I think the whole point of the movie was passing the buck much more than it was pulling the trigger. So I think that was that was essentially what the whole drama was, was where is this decision going to be made and how is it going to be made? Uh, and and I whose that, ass is on the line for making it? Right. On both ends of the missile, right? I mean, so I thought I thought it was it was really good that that interplay of trying to figure out who's going to actually make the decision and when and, and using what data. I liked it. Chad kind of mentioned this briefly, and I did call BS on the two pilots. I figured that when he uh, when he kind of refused to to shoot the first time, maybe he was following proper protocol, but kind of refusing not to take the the shot and going against the orders. He, it kind of seemed like he was the wrong person for that job, and I didn't exactly know how these two pilots got their position. I understand that they mentioned this was the um, their first. Um, uh, a mission in this sort of role, but they they didn't really seem like they belonged there. And I'll agree with you on that because that's sort of where I sort of lost the Aaron Paul character and the other uh, co-pilot character was did would these people be in this position? I guess that's my question. And would they be allowed to be people who could question a general even though it's a general from another armed service and especially from another nation uh, but they are allies would they be allowed to do this and would there be the protocol of uh, the Aaron Paul character's superior stepping in right away and saying and I'm not talking the uh, British uh, general I'm talking the American commander stepping in and saying okay if you're not going to do this and you're going to question your general which they did bring up briefly, then why wouldn't that uh, commander step in and say, hey, I'm your superior officer. You're going to do what you're told and not prolong this anymore. Uh, that was just something I did question a that's, lot. Well, that's not really how it works, though, in the military. like, And especially not to a foreign general or to somebody, to somebody outside the U.S. military command. Like... The way I read that whole bit was that the the U.S. commander was hesitant too, and he – so he didn't tell him to just do it. But he had to make, make it like – there's a lot of diplomacy that goes along with dealing with other nations' military. So you're saying he wasn't putting his neck out. He was putting his pilot's neck out. Right. Because he did say, you just threw the rule book right at a general. And that's right. where I was like, okay, then why didn't you step in and do something as soon as that happened? That's... I read it more as he was on the fence too. And so, and the other, the other thing is, is that there's a little bit of sort of subtext that's happening with the, the, the images of the drone pilots in Vegas. Like there's been a very long running sort of debate within the military community and, and within like sort of, in somewhat in popular culture, like I think there was a film before this one um, called The Good Kill that addresses what the guys in the trailers in Vegas like go through and that they have to make these decisions and that they carry this with them. Like they, you know what I mean? Like that they, they go home to their wives at night or whatever, but they've dropped bombs on villages. Like, Well, so I did read um, in preparing for this that they've reported – that the drone pilots are um, getting PTSD levels on on par with combat veterans. Yeah, yeah, and and getting them actually help for PTSD has been a really big deal, because people are like, well, they've never seen combat. Well, yeah, they have. It's not just a video game to them. Like, and in a way, like, I think it's even harder for them, right? That because they're not they don't flip the deployment switch and leave for seven months. They have to go work 12 hours and then go home and pretend that everything's normal. And then they have to go back and do it again. And like, so that, you know, so there's a little bit of subtext happening there that I think maybe the average viewer might not fully understand. Well, Alan Rickman's it character. It might not even be intended, but. Alan Rickman's character fully stated that though at the end when, right. where he said, don't ever tell a soldier. Um, what was, do you remember the exact line? Yeah, it was, it was, don't ever say that a soldier doesn't know the cost of war. Cost of war, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so no matter what and, their position you know, is. Him I buying think... the doll in for his daughter and, like, that 
that whole that's one of the reasons that I thought that it was really well done because I think that the the sort of narrative that we have culturally about the drones and a lot of people believe that we're just like it, that it's just a video game that we're just dropping bombs on people willy nilly and that there's no like sort of humanity behind that. And so I, I liked the fact that it was very sympathetic to the people that have to do that and have to make that decision because really what the film is saying is that there's no good answer. They had to do it. And it, it did a really good job building up that tension that, that, that had to be done. It's a damn, yeah, if I you think... do damned, if you don't. Right. Oh, yeah. It's a catch 22 situation. And so it's not just that we pick an HVT high value target and just, you know, eliminate them. I mean, sometimes it works out that way, but it's much more complex than that. And I left this, I left the movie thinking that basically every high school student should have to watch it. I think it was a, it was kind of a modernized realistic version of the, the trolley problem, you know, the, the old philosophy yeah. class trolley problem where the train is, is headed towards what is it like four or five people and, and you have a switch, and if you throw the switch, it's, it'll run over one person. And uh, and then, you know, the class has to debate about whether or not they throw the switch or, you know, what, who whether or not a person should make that decision and whatnot. But, you know, it was a very grounded application of that, of that hypothetical where um, – and Alan Rickman and Helen Mirren's characters were kind of there to, to personify the, the throw-the-switch argument. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if anyone else really, really thought they shouldn't throw the switch. I think their, their question was um, how many people are really on the, the other portion of the track or do we know or when do we know? So, no, I, I think I think the movie was very fair to the people involved and um, it personified them as conscientious and um, very deliberate people who wanted to to make a right decision, you know, whatever it was and however they got there. And I think it, you know, it was fair to the idea that, well, if you don't act, something more terrible could happen. If you do act, something terrible will definitely happen, but might be significantly better than the alternative. I, I think I think there was a lot there to, to chew on. Well, after Matt's lovely comment there, uh, we have a new commentator from the land down under. Shane A is joining us. Hi, Shane. How's it going today? Hey, guys. I'm really well, and thank you for accommodating me, even if it is a bit late. No problem. Uh, did you want to comment on what Matt just said, by the way? Or are you? I didn't hear what Matt just <laughs> I said. I know. I'm just being stupid. <laughs> well, if it's come out of Matt's mouth, it must be really awesome and, you know, true. <laughs> it, it, it was spectacular. So I was comparing this to the to the trolley problem that, that they use a lot, and college philosophy classes where you have to decide if you're going to throw a switch, you know, in the trolley problem, you have say five people, um, you have a train out of control and if it continues on its course, it'll hit, you know, five people. But if you throw a switch, it will only run over one person. So the whole point is if you, if you do nothing, five people will die without anyone making a conscious decision. If you intervene, you make a conscious decision to kill one person. And I, I thought this movie seemed like a, a very realistic and grounded trolley problem for the modern age. Uh, definitely. I've never heard of the trolley problem, but um, the pr it's a pretty serious subject matter. And I'm sure there are incidents like this happening on a regular basis that the media are not made aware of. Happen a lot, probably big decisions to be made and the way they did it in the film. I mean, it kept the intense intensity up at high levels for a long period of time. Now, why were the, um, the English, why was Britain in charge of this? Is it because it was Kenya and that's, um, that was traditionally part of Britain? Cause I would think I that this would have been a U.S. mission from start to finish. I was, or is it just because they got two great English actors and, and then, so they're like, well, we need to make this British, uh, Britain's in charge. I it was think a that it, British agent that was uh, executed at the beginning of the movie, if I remember right, when Helen Mirren's character 
got out of bed and went and started doing her debrief. We talked about uh, how a British Kenyan agent had been murdered by the terrorist group. And so that's how she jumped into all this. Jonna, what were you going to say? I was just going to say that in sort of missions like this, the the world is essentially divided into theaters and they and different intelligence agencies and different um, military agencies from different countries are in charge of, of different slices of the planet. Um, and I, I, I just assumed that it was um, a British run um, mission because of the theater that it was in. Well, it was, Kenya was part of Britain for almost a hundred years, I think. So maybe they still have some sort of um, old imperial ties to the country. I think they must have still some sort of ter- territory say in things because at one point I do remember when they were sitting around the table and they were talking about contacting the Americans and then they did contact the Americans. The Americans said something like, oh, well, if this is British. This is happening with the British decisions. What are they contacting me for? I think that was when he was playing ping pong. Ping um, pong in yes. China. That wasn't stereotypical at all. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> I hope nobody else yelled Noonan when they saw him pop up on their screen, did they? I, 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 I was really proud of Forrest Gump to rise to the level of Secretary of State. I thought that was a nice touch. <laughs> That's good. Now, uh, Matt, you're not a big fan of the kid actors, and we had, I guess you could say we had two in this one. The, the girl was the main source of conflict in this one, in this film, I, um, I believe. So what did you think of our two kid actors? Well, I think they, they did a good job. Um, you know, cause first of all, you had, you had what I thought was a really good ensemble cast. Just, just everyone was really good. Even the people, um, I didn't recognize whose names I didn't know played their parts, um, very, very well. And I think what you do that that really works is you don't you don't really let the kids compete and you you don't give the kids more than they can handle. And so, you know, you had the girl who who was great at what she did. Um, She she was kind of a there to be a little more superficial character, but a very charming, very charming young lady who was kind of there to to show us the cost of these decisions. And she did great. And then I think you're referring to the to the boy who who went to go buy her bread or the one who bought the buckets. Um, uh, well, actually, I forgot there were two boys. Um, I, I guess you could comment on either one. I, I thought to me the the boy who uh, was buying the bread was just an extra excited he get to, he got to be in a movie and uh, yeah. he was just happy to be running to where they told him to go run. Yeah, I think and, and the boys they were fine. They they weren't there a lot and they didn't do a lot and they didn't screw anything up, which mm-hmm. is, you know, most of what you can ask from a child actor. Well, with the kid that um was the, with the buckets, he was doing what any would probably do. I mean, he was sort of really keen on playing with that little device that the guy had, you know, thinking it was a game. So he thought, well, you know, he wants to have a go at the game, but now he's going to get some money with the buckets. You know, that's what any kid would want to do you know with this technology full of world the world's full of technology and games that, that kid was super keen to play whatever game he thought was being played and he was good he was a good good young actor or should i say non non-actor because you'd think that they wouldn't have used you know anyone that was been in movies before uh the little girl was great i thought she did her part well i mean no looked natural the whole time uh, never looked like she had fear on her face or looked like she was out of place. I thought she did great. And the little boy, yeah, Shane hit the nail on the head. He looked like a little kid who sees somebody playing a video game, especially in a third world country. And he's wants to know what's going on. He's interested in it the whole time. Uh, very inquisitive. And then because this person's sitting there playing a video game, he wants to be around that person. So that way he can eventually get it hold of it himself and starts yeah. playing with the buckets and rolls forward with it. I mean, it's very natural uh, performance on both parts. I thought the little girl, I, well, I thought they both did a great job, the, the kids, but in particular, the little girl and the setup 
at the beginning of the film where they um she's learning and then the the imam is coming to the house or something and so they hide the fact that she's learning and i think that they did a really good job with little details like that like the doll that alan rickman's buying like the just the there were a bunch of little things where they made more clear or heightened the tension on what's at stake well they had a lot of parallels in this film i'll agree with that and the the little girls were the two one was the the girl that was going to get killed and one was his daughter basically the, the same person i also kind of thought there's a parallel between the two pilots and the the guys who took the the girl to the hospital kind of like maybe they didn't fully agree with what was going on in their world but that was their job and they had to follow their rules no matter what because that's what they were their duty was so i thought that they they had a lot of parallels uh throughout this film that's true i never thought of that and just on the little girl too i i think that the little details like john has said when um, the undercover agent Barkhad Abdi bought all the bread, gave her all that money, and she was about to go. And then he got yelled at, and all the bread spilled. She picked it up all again and resold it. So she kept, she pocketed that money she already had, and you know, got more, wanted to get more money for her family. So mm -hmm. that's smart thinking for a kid. Yep. Would, would a kid be allowed to sell? A little girl be allowed to sell like that in a in a pretty uh, Islamic um very strict oh, islamic no. state i that's the one thing i i thought that they would not have let her out on the street alone not you bring up a good point because they also had a like a 10 second clip of one man whipping another woman because they were able to see her wrists, wrists. Mm -hmm. yeah they didn't have a wrist cut up, covered up and i was like Okay, yeah, that's that's what I was thinking, and I'm with you, Chris. Would they have let the little girl do this? But, I think that the the difference is that she was a little girl. And it's a good point, yeah. Because in okay, so I've taken a couple of classes on like Middle Eastern humanity stuff, and the until they're of like married marriageable age, they're considered completely differently than women. They're not. They're not as protected as women are, like, or as, I don't know, I don't have a good word for that. I don't like the word protected, though. But I think you well, know what I mean. It was, it was still a bloody, hostile environment, so that's for the parents to sort of, that they maybe had no choice. They need the money, and they sent her off to do that, but it is a hostile environment that you wouldn't think a child would amongst and you're right chad when he said that they were whipping the lady for showing wrists and then the next shot was when you saw the the girl unloading her parcel to put the bread on the table and her wrists were covered by the way because i it was yeah and the first thing you looked at yep. was her wrist because of that same here it's just as that was a great little detail they threw in there it's like you couldn't they didn't want to see the little girl being educated they didn't want the they didn't want the little girl using the hula hoop. Um, the lady had to have her wrist covered, and she got whipped for not having her wrist covered. But yeah, and then the little girl selling the bread and getting away with stuff. Yeah, it was just the little details. They did a great job of showing all that stuff and heightening the tension of there are a lot of bad people in that area, and you get to, or I don't even want to say bad people. I mean, just people of different ideologies and all that and is it right is it wrong and you get to make the judgment and it goes back to what the um helen mirren's character says about the propaganda war right i mean the the idea that there are sort of moderates or people who would educate their daughters or those sorts of things and the the really tough balance we strike with alienating those people who could help us or who could turn the tide or who could, you know, and this is a real, this is a really big deal in the international relations areas of this, you know, how do, how do we protect say translators that help us in Syria or, you know, in or that Iraq. Somali guy, they left him for himself. Yeah. Yeah. So there's just a lot of nuance and, and ins and outs in this movie. And I was really, 
I saw it twice in the theater, um, which I'm kind of El Cheapo, and I don't like to pay to see something twice in the theater, but I did. And um, I I was on the edge of my seat the second time, even though I knew what was going to happen. So they did a really good job with the tension and the, you know, all of the interplay. Yeah, I know that I was very frustrated. I'm just like, would somebody please make a decision? I, I honestly didn't even care what their decision was. I just wanted somebody to step up and make the call. Well, Helen Mirren was trying to step up, but she was going through all the bureaucrats and mm -hmm. red tape. Yeah. She had her way. And I think there was a little intentionality of the sort of the slow motion. Mm hmm you know. Well, the irony of it all is if they would have acted originally when uh, Helen Mirren's character wanted to, th the casualties would have been less. They wouldn't have killed that little girl because she was still waiting for her mom to finish cooking the bread. So if they would have acted right away, um, it, it would have bypassed all this drama. And like, John, I've seen this twice and I rated it highly. I gave it a a great review when I first saw it and the tension building at a really considerable pace. Uh, and I would still recommend it because it's a top notch drama, but I've got to uh, say that it lost a little bit of impact for me. The second viewing, I still enjoyed it, but I don't think I was um, absorbed by the story as I was the first time. Cause I knew what was going to happen. And that doesn't always happen to movies. I like when I see them a second or third time, but, but this, this particular one I did, um, I think I appreciated Helen Mirren's, uh, her role a lot better too in this and a couple of the other actors, but the, the impact I remember having when I first walked out of the theater seeing it the first time, uh, I didn't have the second time. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit the second time I watched it, I think too. I think it was, it was just as good for me in a little bit different way. Again, not having the plot tension there. I think yeah. I enjoyed the acting performances even more um, just watching how they all, how they all came together. And I think the, um, the bureaucratic layers, I think were a little more, uh, I, I found a little more depth to them the second time around. So. Yeah. I think I could pay more attention to some of the detail, the little details because the first time around, and I was still, like I said, I was still on the edge of my seat the second time. The tension was still good. But because I knew what happened, it wasn't exactly the same as it was the first time. And then the first time, I was just like, oh, wow, what are they going to do? And it makes you feel like you want a suspenseful or thriller movie to make you feel, right? I mean, how are they going to fix all this? And there wasn't a, a, a good solution to it. I mean, <clears throat> they started out the good guys in this film, but in a way they kind of ended up the bad guys because the dad wasn't going to be blaming the, the terrorist. He was going to be blamed. You know, the, the British were the terrorist to him. They, they killed his daughter and the people we consider the bad guys took his daughter to the hospital and tried to save her. So they kind of flip flopped it at the end. And one of the uh, keys that I thought was funny to the whole operation was the fact that they the drone strike went the, uh, the first bomb hit and they did couldn't kill everybody and so they had to do a second one and i thought that was sort of very apropos for this situation because it took so much time and so much decision making and after everybody had gone around in circles a million times trying to figure out who in the hell was right and wrong and even eventually lying about some of or misleading about some of the information that they couldn't even get the job done adequately enough to uh, finish everybody off. So they had to do it a second time. And I thought that was a nice little touch to this as well. That was the result of um, altering the course of the missile. And uh, so it didn't kill everybody like the first one could have, if exactly. they aimed the correct spot, you know, so they had to do two and, the second one, I mean, we didn't really see what other collateral damage was happened with the second one, but you know, there could have been other people on the other side, but this film wasn't about them. It was about the little girl. Yeah. But yeah, that was a nice little wrinkle to it. And I appreciated them doing it that way. And then having to watch Aaron Paul's poor character have to let loose two bombs. 
That was yeah. another piece of it that was very uh, emotional. Well, the woman that was still alive, she was crawling along. She was the main target too. So that I don't think they had a choice. They had to go for that second bomb to finish the job. And Aaron Paul, as you say, Chad, his acting is fantastic. He's he's not made the best film selection decision since his Breaking Bad days, put him in the uh, spotlight, but uh, he's done some okay movies, and this is one of his best ones for sure. I didn't like Need for Speed or Triple Nine was pretty good, but Central Intelligence, he showed his com- comedic side recently, but this is definitely, I think, his best film to date. He's appeared in since Breaking Bad. And this was Alan Rickman's very last film. Uh, well, I guess he was in Alice um, Through the Looking Glass, but he was just a voice in that one. This was his uh, his last to be seen on film, right? Yeah, the when he walked out of that uh, room and then talked to his cohort in the hallway about the doll, that was his last acting performance ever. And it was a good one. Uh, exceptional, yeah. I mean, he was Alan Rickman, yes, but he did a great job of trying to stay calm and present the character and do his job as the character needed to be done. And he, he showed his emotion when he needed to show his emotion like he does in almost all of his parts. He sort of stays <laughs> yeah. stays in that midline level, and then when he needs to emote, he does. He'll always be Snape to me. He'll always be a yes. German terrorist to me. Exactly. He'll always be Hans Gruber. <laughs> yeah. I was waiting, waiting he was going to bring up Hans Gruber. Yeah. Uh, I just think um, Chad hit it on the head by saying Alan Rickman's performance was exceptional. In that war room, which was the majority of his scenes, he just was in control the whole time. And, yeah, he knew when to pipe up and then the rest of the time he might just sit around he was making the decisions and you know he was almost the middleman and that little speech that he does at the end the little monologue before he walks off is, is great as well saying uh, never tell a soldier that he does not know the cost of a war was just a was perfect to finish on for him and that was the best line in the movie yeah very well, good every every piece of information i read about this film that is quoted that that that's the line of the movie. And I would give that and Helen Mirren's line about the propaganda war is that that's, those are the, the key elements. Yeah. Cause I go back to the quote that they showed at the beginning of the movie and war truth is the first casualty. I mean, you knew that there was going to have to be some kind of mistruth or lie that went into all this stuff. So that was one of the things I was waiting for throughout the, whole storyline and once it popped up i mean people will try to sell it as being something small but it was major and like i say after all the going around and going around it the the analyzing didn't quite come up to snuff and yeah they had to let loose a second bomb and yeah the operation was a success but yes the there are always casualties and uh, outside the parameters and sorry it happened but it's the emotional toll that we take as viewers and we get to experience it all and it's great to have that experience i'd watch helen mirren uh, mow the lawn just i'd watch her in anything she's so good and uh you have already spoken about this before i came on air but the uh the role was not intended for a female it was intended for a, a guy it was written for a guy and when Helen Mirren, manager, and um, went to her and talked about the film, the producers wanted her, and they rearranged certain aspects to it to accommodate her. And I couldn't see anyone else in that role. She was so good and not quite Oscar-worthy, but she was just fantastic. And uh, I made it her own. She really can do almost anything, that actress, Dame Helen Mirren. Yeah, I totally agree with Shane. I, I would have thought the role was written for her. She was that natural in it and did it that well. No, they uh, adjusted it for her. And why wouldn't you? If someone like Helen Mirren wants to play a role in a movie, you're going to do it. So I'm glad they did. And you wouldn't know. You're right, Matt. Well, while we're on um, the acting, uh, 
Phoebe Fox is the actress who played Aaron Paul's partner in the, the little room they were in. And she sort of goes un, unnoticed, but she had a really decent role to play and had some nice little moments. She looked a little bit like a young Sean Young, I thought. Maybe I'm just seeing things. But I, I highlighted her in my review of the film when I first saw it, and I'm seeing it again. I still think she's she's great. She just has little moments, and she bounced off Aaron Paul's acting really well. Well, she took the most delight in the little girl hula hooping in that scene. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the lighter moments. There weren't too many. The music was good, too. It was subtle. They could have had real high tension, you know, uh, trumpets and, you know, a big orchestra playing, but they kept it low key and sort of like a, a moody soundtrack, which built the tension up. I think it fit real well because I don't even, um, I didn't even notice the soundtrack, but I'm sure it definitely added to the tension. Yeah, it was, it was a low key and it was playing under a lot of the scenes, but it was there. It was like a constant sound more than it. More than music, it was more of a constant sound and occasionally it would pipe up um, when it had to, but they didn't wasn't overbearing like a lot of these movies can be. Did you guys talk about the um, those drones yet? That little bird on the on the wire and then it flew in around the windows. I would have thought someone would have noticed that. Chad said and it was very fly. Clash of the Titans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. And and what about the fly running out of batteries um, or the beetle? I'm sure they would have a battery that lasted, you know, 24 hours or something for something like that or a backup. Now, um, Chad and uh, Shane, we just reviewed Simon Says where they had the same sort of devices. <laughs> Who did it better? We're on, we're on the same page, Chris. Um, I think um, Eye in the Sky did it just slightly better than the uh, robotic <laughs> fly and Simon Says. But, yeah, you and I are on the same page. I was thinking the same thing when they had the beetle flying through the air. I was like, oh, shit, here we go again. Yeah, I, I, thought, the, I thought the beetle, and to a lesser extent the bird, but the, but the beetle for sure, was it was really just a plot device, right? I mean, yeah, that, those nothing like exist. that really exists in real life. And, but they needed a way to find out that the, there were bombs in the hut. Yeah, and so they they were like, well, let's do something cool. Mm -hmm. I and, mean, the sketchy van um, surveilling them from across the streets uh, pretty played <laughs> out anyway, right? And that sketchy van pulling up in a real hurry, um, the guy throwing money at the vendor to buy his buckets and then taking off again. That seemed pretty, you know, it stood out. You would Not think very it was subtle. Something. No, and there was so much military around. And even when he's sitting down um, controlling the beetle from that little, uh, like the kid thought it was a game, that little controller, the kid calls him out. He sees it straight away. But I'm surprised the military going backwards and forwards around him didn't didn't see him. You know, he was just sitting there. He wasn't that well hidden. You'd think that one of them would approach him. Just didn't look right when everyone else was, you know, trying to sell stuff and walking around. He was sitting there playing with the device. It seemed a bit, a bit obvious to me. And he didn't even need to be out in the open from the looks of those no. controllers. No. And when the beetle was in the hut, I noticed that there was no ceiling fans. That would have taken out the beetle. And they must have really good air conditioning because they usually have ceiling fans as well in Middle Eastern countries. Just just, just me thinking <laughs> too much, probably. Well, no, you bring up a point. You're talking about the drone, Shane. I did find an article when I was reading through some stuff that said a, the drones that they were using, I think they're called Reapers would not be able to hover as they depicted in the movie. It yep. was those drones would have to circle around. So that camera shot that they continuously showed from that one angle would not have happened that way because you'd have to have a continuous, the camera would have to be moving in a circle uh, the whole time. So that's something if you want to get technical about the, how they showed the or depicted the technology in this movie that's one you could sort of throw rocks and stones at but i mean for the sake of doing the movie it worked and i had no issues with that i had more issues with boo boo the owl flying around again fair enough <laughs> i i mean it 
it sort of even shows you at the start when Helen Mirren sort of casually got up in the you know four fifteen a.m. it said, and she's gone out the backyard, let the dog in, and she can she basically could have controlled everything from her little personal war room in her backyard almost. Seems like she had the technology there, and that was another point to the movie. It's showing us that you really don't need to be in these places for things to happen. And you can be anywhere. Technology is going to react all over the globe. Even the military's in the cloud. Yeah, it seems that way. All right, well, let's go around the table. Um, and Matt, we'll start with you since this is your first uh, Movie House Concessions. Um, after all said and done, how do you rate this film? And actually, did you put this in your um, top film of 2016? I give this movie a solid um, four stars, a solid four out of five. I think it's a great movie. Um, I was delighted to see it. I think it's easily one of the top movies of 2016. Um, I mean, I haven't created a, a numerical order, but it would definitely contend for, I think, the best movie I have seen of 2016. I think um, the cast was great. The tension was great. And um, I just think they, they approach things in a, in a very um, nuanced and thought-provoking way that, that made it really entertaining from start to finish. Mm, Chad? Uh, I'm going to be about on the same page here with Matt. I'm going to have to give it a solid four uh, flying birds. Um, no, I'm not talking the middle finger. I'm talking the mechanical birds. Um I'm going to have to go go for Flying Birds. I think it's a solid movie. Uh, it's not one of the best I've seen this year, but um, it's definitely, I'll say, in the top 20, 25, but it's good enough to get there, and I recommend everybody watch it just to uh, experience it and see how it affects you emotionally and psychologically you know, like the rest of us who've seen it once or twice, and go from there. I think everybody will enjoy it. And I also want to say that if it's this definitely was Mr. Rickman's last movie. And if anything, go watch it just to see him one more time. Shane. Ng? Well, it's a surprise packet. I didn't know what to expect when I saw it. I give it a solid four out of five and that's both viewings. Didn't, I didn't lose any um, rating on my, my side of things when I saw it a second time. I like how it could have gone the Hollywood ending. Uh, it could, a happy ending but they didn't choose to go that way there was a glimpse of it because you saw the little girl getting rushed to the hospital with her parents and you'd think you know she's going to survive but she didn't she passed away on the operating table and then we saw aaron paul and the phoebe fox character being told by their superior that we need you 12 hours later probably just to do it all again so they didn't cop out and go for the hollywood happy ending it held its tension all the way through and helen mirren and alan rickman among others, are worth the ticket alone just to see this film. Highly recommended. Surprise movie for me in 2016. Don't make my top 10, but it is, it's worth an honorable mention for sure. And, yeah, I'll agree with, with you all. I'm going to give it a four out of five as well. Like I said, I dislike uh, war movies. They're just not my thing. But every so often I'll see one that, uh, that gets my attention and um, it, it's a very well-made film and and this is one of them I'm glad I, I did watch this one it was a it was a great pick from Jana and um, I, I love the actors I think Alan Rickman's you know it ended up being his last performance in his his line uh, about the soldiers is the perfect way to end uh, I guess a career so um, I think that this has a lot of great things which you guys have already stated but, uh, Jonna, this was your pick, so we'll give you the last word on it. Yeah, I um, I would give it four out of five hula hoops, Hellfire missiles, Beatles, whatever we're using <laughs> this minute. Um, I, of course, really enjoyed it. I recommended it. Um, Shane actually told me to see it, so I went on his recommendation earlier on. Just really well made, great cast. Alan Rickman's awesome. Helen Mirren's awesome. Um, the guy whose name is go that's going to leave my brain right now, who was in Captain Phillips, who played the agent on the ground, was really good. I mean, everybody was really good in it. And it's well worth the watch, if for nothing else, than the sort of intellectual exercise of thinking through the questions the film presents. So I really enjoyed it. I'm glad you liked my recommendation. 
Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> well, that's it for our review of Eye in the Sky. Please let us know what you think of the film in the comments section on our website and rate it from one to five stars on that page as well. If there's a film you'd like us to review, please send us an email to comments at moviehousememories.com and give us your name and city as well. Well, that does it for this episode of Movie House Concessions. Matt, I would like to thank you for coming on. Hopefully you'll show up again for one of our podcasts on this one. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> uh, until next time, I'm Chris. I'm Jonna. Hey, I'm Chad. Thanks for showing up. And I'm Matt. And I'm Shane A. Thank you for letting me in a little bit late, but better late than never. And this concession stand is now closed. This podcast is not endorsed by Bleecker Street Media and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Eye in the Sky, all names and sounds of Eye in the Sky characters and any other Eye in the Sky related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Bleecker Street Media or their respective trademark and or copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Movie House Concessions, the MHM Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.